Welcome to Renegade Conversations. My guest today is a broadcaster, a podcaster, a speaker, a coach, and an author, and I can't wait for you to meet her. My name is Meryl Cook. I'm an artist, a renegade, and the host and creator of Renegade Conversations. My mission is to provide thought-provoking, fearless, and fun discussions with remarkable female rebels who are shaking things up in their respective fields. My hope is to make you question the norms and ignite your own renegade spirit. This episode of Renegade Conversations is sponsored by the Cultured Coconut, a traditionally fermented organic coconut milk kefir that's free from dairy, sugar, and gluten. It's the most powerful and affordable natural probiotic. And it's proudly made by a woman-owned business based in Nova Scotia, Canada. It's widely available across Canada and in the U.S. And it can also be ordered from the cultured coconut directly. My next guest is Nancy Reagan, and I'll read to you from her bio. Nancy is a professional communicator whose dynamic career includes TV and podcast hosting, emceeing, and presentation coaching. She has a passion for storytelling and engaging with others in conversation and creative collaboration. A lifelong lover of language, Nancy recently released her first book with Nimbus Publishing. It's called From Showing Off to Showing Up, and it's an open and vulnerable account of her experience with imposter syndrome and perfectionism and her adventure-filled journey to a life of authenticity. The book hit the Globe and Mail national bestseller list within two weeks of its release, and I just finished reading it, so I can't wait to tell you a bit more about it. Nancy built her reputation as the highly rated host of CTV Atlantic's Live at Five for 15 years, broadcasting to a daily audience of approximately 350,000 viewers. She also served as the host of CTV's Good Morning Canada and that news show on TV Tropolis. During her broadcast career, Nancy interviewed many of the biggest stars in the world, Oprah, Madonna, Harrison Ford, Mel Gibson, Christopher Plummer, and Gwyneth Paltrow, to name just a few. She has a well-honed gift for putting people from all walks of life at ease. And now she relishes working with others to help them conquer their fear of public speaking and find their own level of comfort in the spotlight. She also shares her knowledge, experience, and enthusiasm in keynote and workshop presentations, including her signature, What TV Taught Me, Lessons in Confidence and Communication, and Presenting You. An accomplished actress, Nancy has appeared on stage at Halifax's Neptune Theater and in TV and film productions such as Haven, the Trailer Park Boys, and Reversible Errors. One of the most recognizable people in the Maritimes, Nancy is known for giving generously of her time and talent to countless charities and is proud to be the mother of three wonderful humans. Welcome, Nancy. It's my great pleasure to have this conversation with you. Nancy, you and I have never officially met, but I've known about you from Live at Five and probably heard you speak as an MC at various fun fundraising and networking events over the years. I just finished reading your book from showing off to showing up. And I was struck by how many times you would be describing an issue that you were dealing with. And I would think, oh, I have a mad about that. Or, oh, I have, to, oh, I have a wild woman about that. So I really think uh, on many things, you and I are on a sim similar wa wavelength. So thanks so much for agreeing to hop on Zoom and have this conversation with me. So Nancy, here's a random question. What are you drinking today? <laughs> that is that's an interesting way to start. That is, hmm, that could be a trick question. It could be. Uh, but you, you did warn me ahead of time. So I have something appropriate and something that I love. It's actually kombucha. And it's specifically a no sugar kombucha because I am really trying to focus on the health of my microbiome lately. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I've been watching a I've been watching a master class on um, the microbiome, and it's fascinating. And it's also very grounding in that mm -hmm. it makes me want to eat 
fruits and vegetables and fiber and really get back to a, a more natural diet that, you know, mm. my ancestors would have eaten rather than what we typically eat today. And sugar is part of that for me. Sugar is, uh, they say it's as addictive as heroin. <laughs> um, and for me, I definitely see an addiction to it. Uh -huh. I, and and I have, as I'm listening to this masterclass, I'm really intrigued to hear how much sugar is devoured by bad bacteria mm -hmm. and how it plays a part in, in creating, you know, inflammation that is, as we know now, science has proven very conclusively, inflammation is a breeding ground for so many mm -hmm. uh, diseases and conditions, mm -hmm. uh, many of which are life-threatening. So Absolutely. why shouldn't we eat well? I keep saying that to myself. <laughs> That's my explanation for my kombucha. Awesome. And, and thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat. Oh, you're more than welcome. And, and you know, it's another moment of synchronicity because our sponsor for today is uh, the cultured coconut, which is coconut kefir. And her, oh, I, thing, I have it in my fridge. Me too, me too. <laughs> and her whole thing is about the gut microbiome, right? So that's wonderful. So mm. I'll be sure to put a link to uh, your brand of kombucha in the show notes. And so people can look that up. Meryl, can I also respond to something you said in your intro? Mm. Um, when you when you expressed surprise that uh, so many of the stories that you read, you could then relate back to your own experiences or work that you've done. Mm. I have to say that that has been the most surprising and rewarding and comforting part of this whole book journey for me my book is very vulnerable as you know mm -hmm. and I was I had some anxiety about it the day it went to yeah, the printer yeah. thinking <laughs> what am I doing my publisher yeah. kind of pulled me into this uh, as a memoir I had planned to write a book about the fear of public speaking but they decided <laughs> that the way I wrote was uh, an indicative of the fact that I could do a memoir and so mm -hmm. here we go but one of the wonderful things really the most enriching things for me has been that I have heard from literally hundreds of people reaching out and saying, you're telling my story. It's like you looked inside my head and you are, you know, telling my story. And not only has that been rewarding because it's been helpful to other people, but it's also been helpful to me mm -hmm. because it really has cemented for me the fact that, you know, this imposter issue that I have have dealt with and perfectionism and fear and all of it is really part of the human condition. And, and so is that idea that we go through the world wearing a, a social mask to show the world that we've got it all together, even yeah. when we're close to falling apart. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's wonderful. It's it's I, I had a similar experience with my uh, my first book, you know, my first book launch, I felt like I was standing up naked in front of yeah. people talking about things that were um, vulnerable, as you say. But uh, I know that everyone has that feeling. And, and, and when I talk about my story, some parts of it connect with somebody else. And, and that's pretty wonderful, isn't it? I yeah, know. it's, it's yeah. the best gift, really. It really is. So Nancy, tell me, um, what does being a renegade mean to you? Oh, wow. I love to uh... I loved the email I got from you asking about this uh, interview because I thought, oh, am I a renegade? Well, <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. Uh, no. I I would never have identified as a renegade in my young years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it excites me to self-identify as that now, having thought mm -hmm. about it since you yeah. asked and I think that for me, it's a, it's ironic in a way because my being a renegade is really rooted in a choice to find my way back to who I really am mm -hmm. and, and step out of the persona that I crafted to make the world approve of me mm -hmm. and to, you know, win the, the good opinion of others, as Abraham Maslow would say. And I feel like that's a, it's a funny way to be a renegade, but I guess maybe that is part of the definition definition. It's really being willing to stand up for what you believe and act without the fear of judgment and, and stepping away from the expectations of others. Mm -hmm. does, that sound, does that fit your definition? 
Oh, absolutely. And, you know, being being willing to stand out and to shout and to say what you believe and, and to dig deeper and find out what do I really believe. Um, so I, I agree. It's it's the finding out who were we supposed to be before life got in the way or before um, society made made us conform or before we wanted to conform uh, to fit in as young girls. and Yeah, things like that. So that's wonderful. Well, so tell me what impact has being a renegade had on you, either on your life, your career, um, your outlook? Well, as I say, uh, in my early years, I would never have defined myself that way. Although people might have looked at me and said, you know, oh, she's on TV. She's got confidence. She's forging her own path. Mm-hmm. I was really trying hard to fit in and be approved of. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the ways I put it now is that uh, I I really wanted to be loved. And now it's much, much more important for me to be love. Mm-hmm. And, and that means love and action in the world and, and in, you know, small ways, big ways, whatever the day presents. Uh-huh. Uh, and I would say that now um, I, I, do feel a bit like a renegade because I have so many people say to me, wow, you know, it's really inspiring to see you step out and be so authentic and vulnerable and you are you seem to be willing to do anything. Mm-hmm. And now it's kind of funny because that's just, that's just how I roll now. Oh. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. and yet, you know, I, I saw role models as I was, um, progressing through my 30s and 40s, certainly, that really made an impact on me. And it's like someone shining a light on a path that you didn't know was there. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's been the most liberating thing. I, I always say that letting my hair go silver was the most liberating decision uh-huh. I ever made. Yeah. Uh, that's the most physical liberate, physically liberating. But, uh, but having written this book, which you know, the process of which was like therapy for me, (laughs) honestly, the best therapy I could ever imagine. Uh, (laughs) I understood myself a lot better when it was done, Mm -hmm. as I came out the other end of the tunnel. And I feel like it has really um, cemented for me, the importance of of really being willing to stand Mm -hmm. out, which is different than showing off. And and I am going to unpack my title because Sure. I think it's really relevant. Yeah. People, people wonder, and I kind of had that intention when I created the title, I liked the idea that someone might see it on the shelf and go from showing off to showing up. What's that about? Mm -hmm. And pick it up and look at it. That was my, it was like, you know, fishing. It was like a little hook. (laughs) And it's very, it's very meaningful to me because as far as I'm concerned, Showing off is when you're moving through the world, uh, Mm -hmm. looking for that approval I'm talking about Mm -hmm. and looking for praise, looking for uh, the good opinion of others. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to say it. And showing up is letting go of living a life according to other people's expectations and actually saying, here I am, this is me. And, And part of that is take me or leave me. And that's okay. And and if if someone, if I, I, it's why the very first line of the book is, you may hate this book, which is both <laughs> possibility and permission, yes. because that gives the book wings, the idea that everyone doesn't have to like it. No. And it's not going to be for everyone. Not, you know, no one is for everyone. We all have our, our different uh, likes and dislikes and, and all of a sudden, I'm living this very different kind of life where I am separated from that need to please. And that sounds like it's been very liberating. Hallelujah, sister. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Wonderful. So this is a kind of a funny question, but in grade two, Nancy, what kind of a kid were you? I was, uh, well, I can read to you a little bit about what kind of a kid I was. I know I have it marked in my book. Sure. I was, um, I'll read you a little passage because okay. we had talked about possibly doing that before. Yeah. Um, and it actually, the title is showing up. So um, there I am now walking out the door to school. I'm wearing polka dot pants and a striped top. There goes my little orphan Annie, says my mom. 
Hmm. I never understood what that meant, but it rolled off me like water off a duck's back. Of course, I know now that she was marveling in good humor at my lack of style. And I'm sure from her perspective, I went out into the world looking like I had no mother to dress me. But that was my happily dorky self. Mm -hmm. The same one it took me half a lifetime to find again. Mm -hmm. And I go on to, you know, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. But that I was a happy-go-lucky kid. Yeah. I couldn't have cared less about what I was wearing. Mm -hmm. I looked like a little boy. I was often mistaken for a little, uh -huh. well, I was sometimes mistaken for a boy. Uh -huh. My brother is close to me in age, one of my five siblings. And he was my younger brother, but he had curly brown hair and these big, beautiful brown eyes. Mm -hmm. And I had straight hair and always cut short. Uh -huh. So people people would say, oh, what a cute little boy and girl. Yeah. <laughs> they went the other yeah. way around. Yeah. And uh -huh. it was, and, and that passage goes on to talk about how I was quite happily dorky, as I, as I say, until the world started sending me messages to say, you've got to morph into a clearer expression of a female. Uh -huh. you, this is how you've got to sit. This is how you've yeah. got to uh, act. This is how you have to, you know, talk. And it's why the cover of my book features me sitting backwards on a chair. Uh, with lovely sneakers. Lovely well, with my Converse on, yeah. sneakers. And yeah. the sneakers are very much about getting back to who I was before the world told me who to be. Yeah. Who and how to be. And the picture I want to quickly uh, explain because I think it's meaningful. Timothy Richard in Halifax is the wonderful photographer who did this. Mm -hmm. We did a fun session, photo session for the book cover. And I sent some of those pictures to one of my best friends who I, I often use as a, a sounding board. I probably sent the pictures to three friends. And this one friend came back and said, oh, I really like that one of you sitting backwards on the chair but the only thing is I, I really don't like seeing women sit with their legs open like that. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I picked up my phone and I called her right away. I said, oh, I want to talk about this. And yeah. she said, oh, she said, I'm embarrassed to have even written that. She said, you know, I know it's old conditioning. It's like, it's not ladylike to sit like that. Uh -huh. And it was like, that's why that is the perfect picture it is perfect exactly yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful that's wonderful I love to ask about grade two because I think that uh grade two is sort of before the society conditioning generally so it's who, what your true nature is really yeah. um so Nancy in your book you mentioned getting to meet and work with many people who've inspired me in my journey um and and inspired me to express more of my inner wild self. And uh, people like Anne Barabay, uh, Oprah, Wayne Dyer, and of course, Audrey Parker. And Audrey came to my first book launch with a mutual friend, Kim King. And she bought, Kim bought a book for Audrey that night. And she said, uh, I want you to write in there, Audrey, write your own damn book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's what I wrote in the, in the uh, inscription. And I know that Audrey's book didn't ever come together, but she went on to do way more than write a book. I mean, she, she influenced our laws in our country and, and she had a huge impact. You also quote Brené Brown and Rumi frequently. And as I was reading, I kept thinking, how awesome is that? And I was making notes. I was reading an ebook, So I was making notes in my, in my journal. And I love uh, one of the things that you talk about is that you always had a barometer for uh, justice, a really strong sense of justice. And you also talk about our need to release e negative emotions, because there's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> there's kind of a, a flavor of the month going around these days where you just talk positive all the time and everything's positive. And, and, and me, I think that's really harmful because if you can't express your negative emotions, they fester and they create illness and disease and things like that. So I was really, really happy for you to see that. But one question that I had for you is um, what opportunities or openings has this book created for you? Because it seems like it's not only opened up this feeling of freedom, but it's it's opened up some opportunities. So what, what can you tell us about? Well, this is where you will run into problems because I am an interviewer and I will take your question and twist it <laughs> 
<laughs> go for it. <laughs> to, how I, to, to the answer I want to give you, I will get to that last part of your question, but I need to address a couple of things that you said first, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, one of them was, uh, first is my friend Anne Beirube would love the fact that you mentioned her before Oprah, Wayne Dyer, and Audrey. Uh, well, she, would, she wouldn't want to be mentioned before Audrey, but that will tickle no. her pink, I'm sure. Lovely. And and she has been an, an extraordinary teacher in my life. Not only is she one of my closest, you know, soul sister friends, mm -hmm. but she has been an amazing influence and teacher in my life. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, The next one is that Audrey was with me. So this chair that I'm sitting on, it's a rounded booth. It's an old restaurant booth, actually from oh, the nice. Palliser restaurant in Truro. And I found it at a restaurant equipment place secondhand. It was uh -huh. an old, green, ugly looking thing. And Audrey went with me the day I went to look at it. And mm -hmm. I have pictures of Audrey and I sitting in this booth Oh. at the restaurant equipment place. And then I also have a, a treasure of an interview, well, conversation that I had with Audrey in this booth because I had a podcast at the time called The Soul Booth. Right. And if anyone is interested in in learning more about Audrey and, and feeling her extraordinary presence, you can Google Soul Booth Audrey Parker. Yeah. And, and she was, you know, just extraordinary uh, to tell your listeners a little bit more. Audrey had uh, cancer in every bone of her body, basically. Her skeleton was just filled with cancer. By the time she found out she had breast cancer, it had metastasized and had, had spread through her whole skeleton. And so she knew that she was going to be leaving and she made her last chapter uh, just incredibly powerful and joyful yeah. And from the day she found out, even before a few hours before she found out the results of her test, she said very memorably, and I say this in the book, you know, Nance, if, if they tell me I have cancer, uh, if they tell me I don't have cancer, I'm going to live joyfully, mm -hmm. you know, because I've had this sort of scare. If they tell me I have cancer, I am going to live joyfully. Yeah. I am not going to waste any time. Mm -hmm. And boy, she didn't waste any time. She she was an advocate for medical assistance in dying. And as you say, impacted our legal landscape in Canada. And she was so gratified, like, you know, profoundly gratified by the role she was able to play and, and by the messages she received gives me what I call truth bumps. It gives mm -hmm. me truth bumps just talking about this. She's in, she's in the booth with me. Yeah. Um, she received messages from all over Canada mm -hmm. from people who were very emotional about her contribution and the fact that she was fighting so hard, but also was such a clear voice for mm -hmm. the cause. And and she, as you know, um, left early. Yes. Uh, her her physical presence left early. She decided to do made before she actually had to because she had identified this loophole in the law and she had cancer going into the lining of her brain. And she knew that if it interfered with her cognitive ability, they would not go through with her medical assistance in dying, even if she did a legal... Uh, you know, if she she drew up leg, legal papers or anything, mm -hmm. there was nothing that could impact that. And yeah. that's what she changed. And and she also was very adamant about the fact that she was fighting for this change for people in this special category that she was in who were mm -hmm. not vulnerable in any right. way. Right. And, and so that's important always for me to mention. Yeah. She, she yeah. had no one who was going to benefit from her death and she was in her right mind so to speak yeah. although I don't like that phrase exactly. anyway okay so yeah. now to actually sure. answer your question I guess <laughs> no worries. after all that um yeah. the book has just been a wonderful springboard for me it yeah. has opened up conversations for me across North America and I've I've had Oh my gosh, I've I've done interviews, but I, I don't even like the word interview, really. I've had conversations with podcasters and radio hosts 
from uh, one end of, of the continent to the other, lots mm -hmm. of in, in the States. Uh -huh. And I've been really, uh, to hearken back to what I said in the beginning, I've been really touched and moved by how it's resonated with people, mm -hmm. you know, a radio host in Texas who would just rave and say, look, I can't tell you what this book has meant to me. Oh, and nice. it's kind of surreal. Yeah, but yeah. it just it it's such a it's such a method of connection. And you mentioned my my uh, adoration of Brene Brown, my appreciation for her wow. for what I've learned from her, starting with her first book that I read, The Gifts of Imperfection, which was mm -hmm. transformative for me. Um, she has continued to be a real lighthouse, and one of the you know biggest learnings from Brene is that we can't have authentic connection and it is a fundamental human need. We can't have it without allowing ourselves to be seen. Mm -hmm. You can't have true connection without right. authenticity. Yeah. And you, it's very hard for people often to truly be authentic because we hold shame about the parts of ourselves that we don't approve of. Mm -hmm. And, and that was very much the case for me. And it took this sort of uh, archaeological dig to figure out why I was so worried for people to see me make mistakes and to see my imperfections as I considered them. Right. And eventually I got to a place where I realized that we're all either flawed or fraud. <laughs> <laughs> We're either flawed or we're lying. <laughs> right. Well, that's the yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. if you if you are purporting to the world that you have no flaws, I believe mm. you're a fraud. And yeah. and are they really flaws? No, they're just they're just aspects of our personality and our you know maybe our uh, our intellect and and so on that we yeah. think are not are not something to be proud of. Uh -huh. And and she has written so much and talked so much about shame. And if, if anyone's encountering this subject for the first time, for goodness sake, Google Brene Brown shame yeah. and vulnerability. And she has two TED Talks that are among the most watched TED Talks on the internet for a reason, because people watch it and go, as I did the first time, like, oh, I never, I never considered like, yeah, I'd like to be authentic. But then yeah. it was like, shame what what <laughs> yeah no and, she's so fabulous so so yeah. digging into what I didn't like about myself mm -hmm. helped me find my way forward to embrace all parts of myself and and mm -hmm. you know actually just be happy to be me yeah it's wonderful it's wonderful can I ask you is there a line or a shape that would define you this is a question that I often ask in my workshops, and it's a way to get people thinking outside the box. But so is there a line or a shape that would define you? And, and if so, what would that look like? Um, I'm going to show you my my ring on my finger. Mm, it's a spiral. Yeah. yeah. And it came from Greece. It's a square spiral, which actually I think is I haven't thought about it. But in some ways, I think it defines me. Uh -huh. um, it defines my life. I, I really believe, and this is something that I learned from Anne Beyrube, I believe that we live our life in a bit of a spiral. And oftentimes we will have frustrating times where we, we hit, uh, um, you know, it's like we're sunk in the mud and we can't get through an issue and we're really frustrated and, mm -hmm. and angry or, or it's a problem that we thought we have overcome before mm -hmm. and we're back in it again and it's again, yeah. you know it's like we're in a labyrinth and it's like what how can I be back here um but as Anne describes it we go through these issues and and we'll hit them on different rungs of the spiral mm -hmm. so as we learn and become more of ourselves basically and more enlightened or more I am not to suggest I'm enlightened at all I'm on <laughs> but I'm on the journey um it's a practice mm -hmm. uh we experience those same challenges and frustrations but we have new tools to yeah. deal with them and yeah. sometimes we are called to say okay yeah here I am again yeah. facing yeah. this lesson again yeah. but it's because I haven't completely mastered it right and, and it goes to that idea of instead of why is this happening to me, 
what is this here to teach me? What yeah, why is this learning? pattern here again? And yeah. uh, and what you know, what do I learn from it right now? And why is it coming up right now? Yeah, I, I I've had had those experiences as well. So yours is a square with a spiral inside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a square spiral, but I also I mentioned a labyrinth, and in some ways, I'd say a labyrinth describes my mind well because it's not a pattern. It's when you go into a labyrinth, if you walk a labyrinth, you uh -huh. think it's going like a spiral, but just as soon as you almost get into the center, it loops you right back out to the edge. <laughs> and it's very much like the spiritual journey, you know, just uh -huh. when you think you've got it all figured out yeah. and your ego is thinking, oh yes, yeah. I'm so spiritual. Yeah. And then, then you go, Whoop, oh no, I've got a lot to learn. And so oh, that's I guess my point is I'm a student. I'm a dedicated yeah. student. I'm a seeker as Audrey used to love to call me. Uh -huh. And she, she leaned into that, you know, she had, she had never sort of gone on a spiritual journey. And she was mm -hmm. very intrigued by my, my path. Uh -huh. And that was part of our, you know, that was part of our conversation before she left. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. And Nancy, what advice do you have for women who maybe want to access more of their own inner wild selves? You know, how, how should they get started? What, what should they do? Meryl, that's a softball if I ever heard one. Like, obviously, I'm going to say, read my book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course you are. But besides your book, so your book no, is actually, and I do highly recommend it. But my, yeah. my book, my book is, I, I say that, I say that with a, a, a you know, a really facetious attitude. Um, <laughs> but I will say my book is meant to be a way to open the door to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not to be, it's not meant to be the be all and end all by any means, right. which is why I talk a lot in my book about uh, many of the teachers that have impacted my life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working with Wayne Dyer and, and what that meant to me, like I described him as a bit of a, a divine, um, uh, a divine obstetrician or something. Because <laughs> it was like, uh, he really helped to birth this new mm -hmm self because he, he he was doing this tour called I am light and it really made me look at whether I had been ignoring this internal light this divine light that I had within mm. for a long time and I think that I turned that light down on a dimmer switch when I was a kid being yeah. told you know you're told be quiet be good behave yeah. but it's very rare that as children were told be like be everything you are be angry to your point be be loud be exuberant yeah. we're told you have to you have to rein all that in and and just to what you said about about um, embodied emotion that was a big part for me of of learning with Anne how to process those emotions and allow them out rather than right. suppressing them yeah and now I'm I'm the best crier <laughs> uh, I will tell you, I, I really believe in feeling emotions and, and allowing them when they surface, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I used to do what a lot of us do, and that is feel it for a few seconds and suppress it. Yeah. So I, I just don't do that anymore. And I, and I feel like I'm, I'm healthier for it. So I would, my best advice is to read a lot of the people that I quote in my book. That's yeah. really my yeah. true answer. Excellent. And 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 Meryl, I'll say self book self-help books get a bad rap. You know, a lot of people will roll their eyes. Mm -hmm. And I really find that interesting because I think in our society we equate weakness with with um having to look at self-help and weakness is bad. We mm -hmm. all want to be perceived as strong. Yeah. I believe that it takes a lot of strength to be vulnerable and to, yeah. to, you know, be on this journey. And I also believe that self-help books, some of them are great. Some of them are not great, mm -hmm. but they're sort of like a hammer. And if, if you have a hammer and you can look at it and admire it, whatever, but if you actually don't do the work to use the hammer, it's mm -hmm. not going to, it's not going to be impactful, <laughs> literally <No>. impactful. It's <laughs> not going to, it's not going to, yeah. you know, put any nails in walls. So mm -hmm. a self-help book, a good one is meant to be used as a practice. And you mm -hmm. actually then have to 
implemented in your life, which is why my book ends with the section practicing uh, the practice of presence. Uh Because for me, I, I, you know, I say from the very beginning of the book, I am not saying I've got it all figured out. I very much present and I hope you got this. I am, I am a student Mm -hmm. and here are some of the fabulous people that I've learned so much from Mm -hmm. in their books that they've been willing to put out into the world. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my best advice. Excellent. That's wonderful advice. Thank you so much. And Nancy, our last question is, um, do you have a question for me? Oh yeah, absolutely. (laughs) When, when did you either start on your creative journey? Because I think creativity And Brene has talked about this and Liz Gilbert talks about this. Creativity can really be interfered with, I use that Mm -hmm. term wisely, by fear. Mm -hmm. And I I even, um, I mentioned (laughs) to my friend Alan the other day, who is uh, an amazing artist, an amazing painter. He showed a little video of him with this, you know, incredible painting that it has so much detail and he flicked little white dots on it with with his mm. paintbrush to mm. to sort of finish off and they were they were you know supposed to be there but it took my breath away and i witnessed myself in that moment thinking oh, he's done all that work what if that went wrong and yeah. that is still you know very much part of my my fear reaction mm-hmm. and not wanting to make a mistake yeah and i'm i am really in love with y- the results of your creativity including these two beautiful pieces you've got behind you, you. so i want to know what your creativity journey has been did you pack it away for a number of years have you always been creative how did it go i guess i've always done handwork um, over the years. And I was a weaver at one point, then put away my big loom when my kids were born, because it was there was no space for it. Um, and I was a rug hooker pr- for about eight years before this whole process started. So in 2015, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I had been a homeopath for 20 years and a Boeing therapist. Really? And, uh, and I, I thought at that time, well, you know, cancer is a pretty deep illness and I, I really need to get my shit together and, and look after myself and not be responsible for other people right now. So I closed my practice and I started writing in a journal. Um, author Sherry Fitch actually introduced me to journaling. Um, oh, just Sherry's wonderful. After, oh, she's amazing. A week after I finished radiation. And so I started journaling and, and I decided that my rug hooking frame would be my way of holding space for myself while I figured out what I was going to do. Um, I didn't, I had no idea what I, what I was going to do. So I just started to write and hook every day. And, and I found the more I wrote, the more ideas for hooked pieces came like prior to this, I had always hooked, um, you know, pictures of things that inspired me or, or scenes. I I had been designing my own rugs, but nothing, uh, nothing that revealed kind of my inner self, I would say. And so I started these doing rugs. I did about, uh, I did seven rugs in a period of eight months that were really just what I saw as the next steps in my healing journey. And so I, and that, and as part of that, I filled five journals um, and wow. wrote my first book. <laughs> so, so it all kind of came together. And, uh, and I think it was the getting so sick and giving myself permission to just design and just to be, and not to have it all figured out. Uh, I think as, as a yes. homeopath, I'd always try to help everybody else and, and be the best homeopath I could be. I never felt like I was good enough. And I know that I helped a lot of people, but I still didn't feel good enough. And, uh, and so this process was just, uh, okay, what do I need to heal? And I knew that I couldn't figure it all out. So I just tried to figure it out one little step at a time. So my books are both called, uh, one loop at a time, because really that's how you get started, right? And and so each of my rugs was just designed that way. And each rug was the next step that I needed in my healing. Um, and then when I finished those and I had finished writing my book, I started to uh, think, well, what do I need now? <laughs> so really they all kind of come out of what do I need? And, and so I started as a line of books, uh, a line of mats called um, my healing heart notes series. So basically... I always wanted the kind of mother that put little notes in my lunchbox. 
you know, that said, hi, I love you. I never got that mother. But, <laughs> but anyway, she was, she was really great in other ways, but she wasn't that mother. And, uh, and so I started doing uh, smaller sort of, I think they were 16 by 16 inch mats that were just love notes to myself. Um, and, uh, wow. and so after those were done, I started thinking, well, what else do I need? Well, I, I need to become more of who I am. And so I started designing my wild women, um, my wild women mats and, uh, and they, they've now morphed into wild women and renegade women. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and they've also, they include, uh, as, as I go, I include more and more techniques. So I started off with hooking and then I thought I had to learn how to spin so that I could spin some of the yarns uh, that I wanted. Oh, really? And then, uh, and then I've learned to wet felt. And so a lot of my newer pieces now have uh, an aspect of wet felting incorporated in them. And, uh, and who knows what's next, but yeah. So oh, that's my can, creative journey. <laughs> can I, can I come play at your house? Absolutely. Yes. After we finish this recording, we'll, uh, we'll look at our calendars and, uh, and let's, let's set up a date to, uh, to do some hooking. Wow. When yeah. I, when I um, interviewed Elizabeth Gilbert in New York in maybe 2018, before she came to Halifax, I, I love the fact that she she talks a lot about creativity and fear. In fact, one uh-huh. of her books is one of my favorite books ever, which is called Big Magic. Yes, if I you, love that book. Oh, it's about creativity beyond fear. Uh-huh. And, and what is inspiration and where do we get it from and how can we foster it and so on. And, and she talked in that interview about the fact that now when she meets someone who she's excited to make as a friend, she'll say, do you want to come and color at my house? <laughs> and <laughs> they'll nice. come for a visit and they'll, you know, instead of sitting and having a drink of wine, whatever, yeah. maybe they have wine, yeah. but, yes. um, uh, but they will sit and they'll create together yeah. and just have fun while they, while they create a connection as well. And I really love hearing about that. Thank you for telling me that. Oh, I'm welcome. so curious to see more of your work. Oh, I'd and love to show you. I have a whole closet full of things. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I, I will be, I will let the listeners in on a little secret in that when we were setting up today and I saw those pieces behind you, I said, I, this is maybe a late time to start a negotiation, but I'm only going to do this if you promise to show me how to start hooking yeah, as a beginner. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's part of our contract. And I thought I'd put it in here now. I know you yeah, can so that we now. have, we have evidence of it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Great idea. Uh, thanks so much, Nancy. So thank you, Nancy, for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Um, I, I'm so delighted to meet you and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to know you on another level uh, when we have our first artist date. So you won't be able to get rid of me now, Meryl. <laughs> awesome. That's Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening. I really appreciate it. And, and I will say the one last thing about my book is that every time this is a first time author thing, I guess, but still every time someone says, Oh, I read your book. I, there's a part of me that goes, it's that not enough part, you know, yeah. that goes, you spent all that time reading my book. Like, <laughs> that's what? wonderful. That's incredible. Can I ask a favor? Absolutely. Um, I, this is my intuition. And I always go with my intuition. Uh-huh. I, I, my gut is important to me, not just with kombucha, but also with instinct. Uh-huh. And, and that is that uh, one of the most vulnerable parts of my book was including poetry uh-huh. my own poetry which is which is sort of juvenilia it's it's yeah. it could have been written by my grade 2 self maybe but it's very meaningful to me and mm-hmm. it's been wonderful because sometimes it resonates with other people so i i'd like to read you the last one in my book oh like i would love that yeah okay. it seems like the right way to since we finished talking about creativity when you describe your process with your art that is also embodied emotion. You know, uh-huh. your journaling and your your creativity is another way to actually let emotion out right. and process feelings. Yeah. And yeah. that's so important for you to be setting that example in the world. Like that's a gift to others. Just when they when we see you, it makes us go, oh, it's like that path. You know, you're shining yeah. a path on a yes. path we didn't know we didn't know it was there. And it's like I can do that. Okay, so here it goes. Great, thank you. Um, it's I just say I'll sign off with this three-pronged wish that is my own special mantra. Find joy, stay safe, be love. And of course, a poem. Serenity isn't easy. 
Sometimes it flows through tears. It's pursued through hours of arduous work that quickly turn to years. When I feel like a broken record, I remember I don't need to be fixed. The spiral serves up lots of joy, but also its share of tricks. It fools me into complacency, believing it's all figured out, then loops me back to the start where I'm mired in fear and doubt. Like the universe that's within me, there are patterns along with the pain. With presence and practice, I see them and set off on my path again. And my last thing I'll say is that my audiobook just came out on Audible and Kobo. And when I was finishing writing, I realized one day, I'm more excited for people to hear my book than I am for them to read it even. So, That's wonderful. And you're, you did the reading? I did, and I oh, and I wonderful. loved it. I had a oh, great how nice! Time. My my pod my podcast team at Podstarter, uh, they produce my podcast, the Canadian well, not my podcast, but the the podcast that I host, the Canadian Love Map, uh -huh. and I um, they I'm so you know so grateful to them. They recorded my audiobook, and it's now available on Audible and Kobo, and the other platforms are a little slower to right. to post it, but they're coming. So Good. Well, I'm, I'm I'll excited. be sure you send me the links and I'll put them on the show notes as well. So oh, thanks again. Nancy. <laughs> thanks again, Nancy. It's so wonderful to speak with you. I hope this episode has left you feeling inspired and ready to channel your own renegade spirit. If you need a little help getting started, please reach out to me. This episode was sponsored by the Cultured Coconut, a traditionally fermented organic coconut milk kefir that's free from dairy, sugar, and gluten. It is the most powerful and affordable natural probiotic. And the best part is it's proudly made by a woman-owned business based in Nova Scotia, Canada. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more Renegade Conversations, also available wherever you get your podcasts as an audio version. Thanks so much for watching. Until the next time. Mm -hmm.